if you would, and open to the book of Isaiah, Isaiah and the ninth chapter. If you don't have a Bible with you, there are Bibles in the pews in front of you. Feel free to use one. If you don't own one, feel free to take one with you. And uh, if you're in, going into that Bible, it'll be on page 832. And that Bible, the little black Bible in the pew in front of you, 832. But Isaiah chapter 9, and I'm sure glad to be here. Great to see you tonight. I see Arlette Jackson, who got baptized this morning, joined the church. She's back here tonight in church already. Amen. And that's good. She got saved at youth conference and said, Pastor, I want to join the church. We uh, talked about baptism. She wants to get involved. And, man, I love that. And then I see uh, one of our newest couples here at church tonight, Trevor and Maylani. Trevor has a story, but I'll let him tell that story. But they got engaged, was it two weeks ago, a week and a half ago now? They're all embarrassed back there. If you don't know them, they sit over there. And they're all embarrassed now. And uh, that's what I like to do here at First Baptist Church. I shouldn't tell you this, but Melani ran the Boston Marathon last week as well. They did a good job on that thing. So, boy, now they're just all over the place. They'll never come back to church ever. And uh, I don't preach people out of church. I embarrass them out of church. And so, uh, and so Brother Abraham, I'm going to embarrass you. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I like you here. Uh, reminds me of a little story. The, a man was candidating at a, a man was candidating at a church and preached just a phenomenal message, Brother Kyle. He preached a phenomenal message. The church was like, man, what an impressive preacher, great message. So they voted him to become the pastor. Man, they're excited, this guy. Man, he can really preach. And he comes the first Sunday, much, much to their surprise, he preached the same message that he preached when he candidated. Well, they're like, well, you know what? I guess that happens. And it is a good message. And boy, he's a great preacher. Boy, this is great. And so they kind of just chalked it up to like just, you know, the coincidence of life and things like that. And, and, uh, and they were even more surprised when the second week they came back and he preached the same message morning, Sunday morning, sending the same message again the next week. They're like, man, I mean, it's a great message. He's a great preacher, but man, he's really like just doing the same thing over again. And uh, then they were more than surprised the third week when he preached the same message again that he'd preached the first, the first two weeks he was there. At that point, the deacons, those deacons pulled him into the office. He said, Pastor, you've got to help us. You've got to change. You have preached the same message three weeks in a row. That's got to stop. His response was, when you start living what I'm preaching, I'll move on. He said, Pastor, where are you going with this? <laughs> Nowhere. Except that tonight, the message tonight in Isaiah chapter 9, is just an encouraging message. It's one that I, that I could preach honestly every single week, and my heart would be encouraged again and again. Just in a, in a small passage of Scripture. And in fact, you know a part of this portion of Scripture if you're here during the holidays because our gigantic puzzle over there is found in part of these verses we'll look at tonight, Isaiah chapter 9. It's amazing how Isaiah uh, brings to light and, and brings to us uh, the conversation about Jesus Christ as the Messiah thousands of years before Jesus Christ came to earth. It's the beauty of the inspiration of the Bible. You see, the Bible was not man's idea. The Bible is God's idea. It agrees marvelously together. It's in unity because it had just one author. He used different human instruments, but just one author, author this entire book. And from the first few sentences to the last few sentences, it all agrees. Isaiah chapter 9 tonight, if your Bibles, please turn there at page 832 in those black Bibles in, in, the, uh, in the pew there, will be hopefully something that will maybe prick us a little bit, but more so encourage us, challenge us. If I had to answer the question, well, what response am I preaching to? And often in a sermon, you're preaching to a response. There are some sermons that I'm going to preach, the response will be salvation. Some will be it's time to get right and, and set aside sin. Others may be letting go of bitterness and forgiveness. But tonight, I would say the response tonight is to answer a couple of questions. One, do you recognize God and how well do you know God? You see, there are some in here and that, could, uh, that could define or could list out a number of things that are of no eternal value. You could break apart a, a huge math problem for me tonight, and that could be helpful, but there's no eternal value in that. Perhaps you could list everyone uh, who is on a current team, and there's no value in that, though it could be helpful at times. Perhaps you can tear apart an engine and put it back together again, and that could be helpful, but of no eternal value. Perhaps you know where all the great deals are, how to invest money, and again, they could be helpful, but of no eternal value. But if you know God, and if you know who he is, that, my friend, is of eternal value. Do you recognize God? There are some in here who you could walk past a major public figure, and you'd have no clue who they are. Others could identify him right away, or her right away. 
There are some who can turn on a movie or television and identify all the actors and actresses and voice actors and actresses, and yet you can't recognize God. It really works. There are times in our life that there are accusations leveled against God. Questions, accusatory questions thrown at God. Why would you allow this? Why would you permit this? Sometimes, unfortunately, it comes from those who are believers. We're walking through a particularly dark path, some hard trouble, and and even then their faith has been shaken. I remember I was in college. And there was a young man in seminary who was a friend of mine. He came to me one day. He said, J.D., I need to talk to you. This man had been through Bible college and was now sitting in seminary classes. And his faith and his world had been rocked. Before he came to Bible college, he was a volunteer firefighter. He and his two best friends from high school had done that for a few years till God called him to the ministry. It was during that time between high school and coming to college that during one such call that one of these three individuals had been taken in a fire. Traumatic, moving experience for him. I was not aware of this. I'd known him as a friend, and we didn't interact. I didn't know his background. But he sat there on the bench there outside, outside on that evening and explained to me that his other friend, that particular week, perhaps even that, I don't think it was that day, but it could have been very close. It was very close in time. Had just lost his life in a fire. Two of his friends in the space of probably four years, both to a fire. And he sat there and wept. He sat there and asked this question. A man who was in Bible, finished Bible college, was in seminary, and he said, why would God allow this? Why would God do this? You see, sometimes these questions are thrown at God, and they come from a place of hurt, and perhaps a place of doubt in our life, and, and sometimes it comes from someone who is not a believer at all. You may have a friend, a, a family member, a co-worker who sees some, perhaps, things they don't understand in life, and perhaps some troubles or tribulations in the world. They see a major catastrophic event, and they'll say to you the same thing, how could your God permit this and allow this? Like, like who is he? What is he? And he can't be that good if there's still bad things happening. I would submit that that question is answered when we know God. The question is answered when we begin to recognize God. Do you know that if you keep your spiritual eyesight tuned in, you will see God everywhere. And if you put spiritual blinders on, then you will see God nowhere. There are those who have spiritual blinders on and God has been right in front of them the whole time and they can't even see him. There are those who claim to be believers who have turned uh, their back in some way on God and, and they refuse to see him work. But my friends, there are those who know God, who recognize him, who cling to him. And some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. He's carried you through dark times and even when times were darkest, you have still seen the hand of God. You've seen his work, and you can declare, God is magnificent. And to others, they look in amazement and wonder, how can you walk this path? How can you see God in this tragedy? How can you see God in the midst of this turmoil? And you say, because I know him. And it may be dark right now, but my God is still there. My God is still in control. He's still around. I know who he is, and I recognize him. Tonight, Look at the scripture. I present to you this thought that God is going to declare three things in this passage. Three declarations from God. The ultimate declaration is this. I am bigger than you. And what I'm doing is greater than you can imagine. That phrase alone from Isaiah chapter 9, the concept here, brings comfort to my life. And that's why tonight I want this message to be an encouragement to you. God is bigger than you. He's bigger than your problems. He's bigger than your needs. He's bigger than your hurt. He's bigger than everything about you. He's bigger than you can possibly imagine. Our minds cannot truly comprehend the vast magnitude of God Almighty. 
Just try to fathom eternity. No beginning. Because everything we know in life has a beginning. And yet God does not have one. And just try to imagine, sit there for a moment and try to comprehend no end. Because everything in life we know about has an end. In fact, there's a little phrase that is coined, all good things must come to an end. Except God. (laughs) He never comes to an end. And that declaration, I am bigger than you, and what I'm doing is greater than you, ought to bring encouragement to my heart. When I lie there in bed at night and the world seems to be crashing down, God is bigger than me, and what he's doing is greater than me. When I'm on top of the mountain, and the blessings seem to be pouring in, and everything I touch seems to be touched by God, and flourishing, prospering, supernatural prospering. And that happens, my friend. Psalm 1 tells us that. The life of Joseph tells us that. When that happens, I'm reminded, God is bigger than me. And what he's doing is still greater than what I can imagine. So tonight, with those thoughts, let's look at the first, if we could, the first seven verses of Isaiah chapter 9. Nevertheless, the Bible says, the dimness shall not be such as was in her vexation. When at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterward did more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. Thou hast multiplied the nation and not increased the joy. They joy before thee according to the joy and harvest. And as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For thou hast broken the yoke of his burden, and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, as in the day of Midian. For every battle of the warrior is with confused noise, and garments rolled in blood. But this shall be with burning and fuel of fire. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Lord, as we look at your word, I ask for your help, for your blessing, and for your hand at work here tonight. Lord, We're needy. Lord, there's some hurt. There's some questioning. There's some smallness of you tonight in here. Lord, I pray that tonight you would just open our eyes just a little bit to see you. That we would see this passage in a new light. And that we would see you with new adoration, new worship, new love. Lord, that we would embrace you and your character. Lord, I pray that tonight that what you accomplish would be eternal. That far past when anyone remembers who spoke tonight or what was perhaps even said around that, they'd remember the scripture. And they'd remember the truth from Isaiah chapter 9. Lord, that when darkness seems to be all around, we can still see you. So Lord, we ask for your help tonight and this time in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to notice, first of all, tonight with just three points, we're going to see in verse number one, we're going to see God's purpose even in the midst of rejection. Now, I'll give you three declarations. I'm going to give you a point, and then we'll look at the scripture. I'll give you a couple thoughts about it, and then God's declaration from it. Isaiah chapter nine, as the, most of the book will, will come about, is not just a standalone passage. Though I often will preach inside of chapter markings, understand, please, that that God did not give us the Bible in chapter and verse markings. They were put in afterwards so that we could find locations easily. That's that's the only reason that they are there. All right, so when I say turn to Isaiah chapter 9, you know where to go. And so I give you a page number because some people uh, may not be familiar with the Bible. So uh, whether it's a page number or or a chapter number. uh, So to start a chapter, to take uh, out a sentence, we must realize where it comes in context. If you are here last week, you remember that in Isaiah chapter in Isaiah chapter number 8, uh, that there was, some, there was some big things going on. That God said, there's some judgment coming from Isaiah, back from Isaiah chapter 7, because people have rejected me. 
And understand that God rewards according to what is sown. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall we also reap. And if we sow to the Spirit, we reap spiritual things. If we sow and plant in rejection, that's what we reap. And God has promised that, God has predicted that, and God has prophesied that in Isaiah chapter 7, 8, and 9, and even before that in, in, in the Bible. And so we come to Isaiah chapter 9, and, and God is saying there is some serious rejection still going on, which if you've been here for the services, you understand that what th- that rejection looks like. God says, try me, look at me, and the king says, no, thank you. I'll do it my own way. I'll leave you out of it. I'm all about me, and you be all about you, God. So in the face of that, well, really when someone is spitting in the face of God, God still shows his character. And we see here God's purpose even in the midst of rejection. And this is what he says. Don't miss this. Isaiah chapter 9, verse number 1. Or actually, look at Isaiah chapter 8, all right, beginning in verse 21. And let's kind of read from 21, 22, and then verse number 1. And they shall pass through it, hardly bestead and hungry, and it shall come to pass that when they shall be hungry, they shall fret themselves and curse their king and their God and look upward. They're going to look for the answers in the wrong places. And they shall look unto the earth and behold trouble and darkness, dimness of anguish, and they shall be driven to darkness. So God says this is not a great picture. But then look at the first phrase of chapter 9, verse 1. Nevertheless, like in spite of all of that, even though that's going on, the dimness... The darkness shall not be such as was in her vexation. He'll go on then to describe that for the next couple of verses. But what the point of this verse is, is for us is this, that God says, even though it's dim, even though it's dark, nevertheless, it will not be as bad, number one, as it could be. It will not be as bad as it could be, and it will not be as bad as they could have identified another time. That they'd be able to compare. It will not be as bad as here and not be as bad as it could be because God is compassionate. Take a moment and comprehend the magnitude of God's compassion to a people who sacrifice here their children, who have spiritually spit in the face of the almighty God And instead of God being vindictive, which is an accusation thrown at our God, he's out to get you. He's out to get me. He's waiting for you to mess up. No, no, my friends, here we see the magnitude of the compassion of God. In the midst of stubborn rebellion, God is and will still be good. Not because of people's response, but because of his character. So put on your spiritual eyeglasses and just for a moment, rest and meditate on the magnificence of God's compassion and God's patience. Aren't you thankful God is infinitely more patient than you are, than I am? Young people, than your parents are, than your teachers, than your boss than your fellow co-workers, than any other name you want to put in there. God is, is infinitely more patient, infinitely more compassionate. So God declares this. The first declaration, God declares, my purpose is greater than you. I am still good. That's what he points out to us in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 1. My purpose is greater than you. You are in rebellion and rejection and stubbornness and wickedness and idolatry and in pagan thinking and lust and all manner of sin. And my purpose, God says, my purpose is greater than you. And I am still good. You know, sometimes it's almost as if we wish God wasn't good. Because then we could level some pretty heavy accusations at him. And yet God is good. Because that's his character. When you see how good God is, it ought to drive you back to him. But why, my friend, does it seem like when the blessings of life come and we see the goodness of God, that it drives us away from God? 
that we get all high and mighty in our life. We get all self-dependent in our life. We're like, man, life is good. And we slide God right back to the corner because, boy, this is rolling so well. The goodness of God, the compassion of God, the patience of God ought to drive us right back to God. Do you recognize him? Do you recognize him? Do you see him in the goodness? When you get the bonus, do you stop right there and say, God, you know what? I need to commit more to you because of your goodness. That's driving back to God. Because when life goes south, it drives you back to God, does it not? Boy, you, you, you get the, the answer from the doctor, and all of a sudden your prayer life is in full, full steam ahead. Right? Why is it that the hardship of life turns us more than the goodness of God? Because his character is not hardship. His character is goodness. God declares, my purpose is greater than you. I am still good. I love Romans 2 verse 4. Not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. The goodness of God ought to lead me and lead you to repentance. But my friends, you and I often have spiritual blinders on to the character of God. We miss the declaration about his goodness because we just go about our way and we, we embrace the blessings. Oh, we're thankful for them. And at Thanksgiving time, we'll, we'll stop back and think about them. Boy, God, you're so good. Praise the Lord. But it doesn't drive us to him. Yet, Isaiah chapter 9, when they heard this decree, it won't be as bad as it could. They should have said, wow, what have we done? What kind of God have we turned away from that would still show compassion and patience in spite of our response? But God doesn't stop there. That could be just one layer of God Almighty, but my friends, this passage gives us three beautiful layers. He goes on in verse number two, please look with me, where he says, the people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. This is a powerful verse. It's powerful because it's listed here, but we also find it in another portion of Scripture. If you have your Bibles, I'd like you to please turn to the book of Matthew in chapter number 4. Hold your finger on Isaiah 9. We're not done yet tonight. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. When life seems the darkest, his light shines the brightest. In Matthew chapter 4, Beginning in verse number 12, now when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee, and leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the seacoast in the borders of Zebulun and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee, the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness, saw great light. Sound familiar? Sound familiar? Came right from Isaiah chapter 9. And to them which sat in the region, and the shadow of death, light is sprung up. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You see, my friends, in the midst of rejection, and in the midst of rebellion, not only do we say the goodness of God, but God makes a second declaration. God declares this, my purpose is greater than you, but my plan is greater than you. I will make a way of salvation. Right here from verse number 2 to verse number 6, we see now the prophecy, the messianic prophecy, the prophecy of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Verse number 6, of course, which we read and we know at Christmas time, for unto us a child is born and unto us a son is given. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counsel, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. God says when life is dark, when life is dim, you, if you look at me, will see a great light. And that light is none other than Jesus Christ, the way of salvation. You see, when God makes a way, he often produces a melody. The melody of the heart, which sings praises to him. 
Throughout scripture, we find numerous psalms and songs. We see the song of Mary. Mary, after the, uh, the angel came to her and said, you're going to bear the Christ child, she sings a song. A song of magnificence. And that, though powerful, the proclamation, though powerful for Mary, also came with darkness. No one would understand from Mary that, that who was inside of her was from the Holy Ghost. It never happened before. It would never happen again. No one will believe you, Mary. But God knows. And yet she had her spiritual glasses on. She recognized God and she voiced her praise to the Lord. We go to the book of Psalms and we see David singing over and over again that when life seemed terrible, when the enemies were all about him and all about him, he said, they're compassing me about. I still saw the goodness of God and the salvation from God defeat my enemies. You see, God produces a way of salvation. Look at some hymns that we often sing here at First Baptist Church. It is well, written after a man lost those close to him, children. Great is thy faithfulness, written after a pastor was forced to resign. He giveth more grace when the burdens grow greater, written by a cripple while she lay in her bed. I love to tell the story written by someone who was very sick, also confined to a bed. <laughs> and how about this one? There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. Written by a man who was dealing with suicidal depressive thoughts. And yet put on their spiritual glasses and saw the declaration from God, my plan is greater than you. I'm bigger than you. I will make a way of salvation. It doesn't always mean that the cripple gets out of the bed. It doesn't always mean that the thoughts stop plaguing you. It doesn't always mean that your children are raised from the dead. Well, my friend, sometimes it means that. Sometimes it means that, and we rejoice in those times. We read about that in Scripture. We've heard about those stories, and, and, and sometimes it means that, but it doesn't always mean that. And how small to just see God when we see the salvation just the way we want to see it. You see, you and I ought to be challenged to see God everywhere. Even in those times when it's dark, that we still can see his great light. God declares, and my plan is greater than you, I'll make a way of salvation. God declares, my purpose is greater than you, I am still good. And tonight we'll see this last point, beginning in verse number seven, where the Bible says, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it, to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Here, God is from verse number one taking a current situation. That what happens, their judgment will still be bound by his goodness and they will not see all that could happen. He then moves on, verses number two through six, and concludes in seven and following, two through six, he moves on, all right, to, to Jesus Christ in the way of salvation, clearly prophesying of the child that will be born. And now, verse number seven and following, we see now the ultimate end of it all. And yet there are so many stories out there about what happens at the end. There's a bright light, the nothingness. It's just a great abyss or... or uh, there's just a waiting game. And yet we look here, and this is God's promise for the end. He says this, that my purpose is greater, my plan is greater, but my promise is greater than you can comprehend. It will be good forever. 
It will be good forever. Now think about the magnitude of this. These people are struggling. They're suffering. And God says, listen, I'm still compassionate. There'll still be some goodness. You will see my goodness. And listen, I'm providing a way of salvation for you. Through Jesus Christ, this child will be born. And listen, no matter what you see now, forever and forever and forever, it will be good. That's what the verse says. Look, verse number seven. Uh, of the increase of his, of his government and peace, there shall be What's the next two words? No end. Forever there will be peace and his judgment. God is saying, listen, a declaration that my my promise is greater than you can can comprehend. You and I cannot comprehend eternity. And God says, and forever it will be good. And that's how you can travel through life. Because today I can look around and I can see God's compassion even in my failings, children of Israel, children of Judah. On the worst day of my life, when life is dark, I can still see the bright light of his salvation. And no matter what happens, this side of glory, I have the promise that forever it'll be good. So what can I go through today? Well, without God, nothing. Without spiritual eyewear, I'll be stumbling. I'll throw accusations. Why, God? How could you? Why would you? Are you not committed to to, to your child? Are you not engaged in what's going on in my life? You're not here. But when I slap on spiritual glasses, I see the character of God, I understand that it will be good forever. And that's why the Bible says in the New Testament that sometimes these trials and situations seem grievous, seem hard for but a moment. You ever been to the doctor? Yes, no? You've been to the doctor? They ever want to give you a shot? Anybody just love shots in here? Anybody just say, listen, you know what? I hope when I go to the doctor I get a shot. I mean, I'm calling the doctor, hey, you got any new shots you can give me? There's some weirdos in life like that. Not most people. Most people are like, eh. Now some are deathly afraid and some are just like mildly discomforted by a shot. There are a few shots in life I don't wish to repeat. One was in my foot one time. At that time I had a, a little planter's wart that was like eight, nine, maybe ten years ago now on my foot. I went there for something else, a little skin thing. And I said, oh, by the way, doc, I got a little planter's wart. The doctor said, listen, he goes, I've got a brand new treatment. Do you want to try it? You know me well enough, like, I'm a visionary. I love these things. I'm like, I'm all in. And I'm like, it's coming out of my mouth before I even know what it is, all right? Yeah, sure, why not? It's a shot. Oh, are you kidding me? He's like, i got to put a shot in the bottom of your foot. I tell you what, that shot in the bottom of my foot went straight to my head. I don't know. I mean, it was like, wow. Wow, right in the middle of the planter's ward. I came off the table. I was like, oh, my goodness. And uh, <laughs> it's like, wow. You know what? It feels great, Doc. Wow, it feels better. Two weeks later, I go back, and it was still bothering me. He goes, let me look at it. He goes, ah, oh, you know what? I didn't put enough into it last time. we got to do it again. <laughs> Experiment, huh, Doc? He said this, though. He goes, that will, that will never come back there again. You'll never have a problem with that again, period. I don't have a foot any longer, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and now I knew what was going on. Braced myself for it. Oh, man, that shot went <clears throat> right there. And it was grievous for a moment. But I believed, I believed that what happened would be good. And guess what? It was. And now, my foot feels great. Never had a plan, I have not had a planner's word, period. Like what he said was true. Unbelievably so. And now I can laugh about that. I can still, if I imagine, maybe pretend to feel the shot in the bottom of my foot going straight to my brain. Man, he had some nerve. But really, in perspective, eh. You see, when life comes and there's darkness, we begin to question God without spiritual focus. We begin to say, God, where are you? Are you really good? And Isaiah chapter 9, in the midst of a major prophet in the Old Testament, things that we would almost miss if we were just quickly speed reading the passage, we see the character of God revealed. We see the declarations of God like, my purpose 
is greater than you, I'm still good. My plan is greater. I'll make a way of salvation, and my promise is greater than you comprehend. It will all be good. So tonight, the invitation is simple. Hope your heart's been encouraged, but perhaps tonight maybe you need to put back on the right view. Maybe tonight you've allowed some of the things out here to just dim the character of God for a moment and just kind of tilt the perspective of God. I can remind you that God's compassionate, he's patient. He's not looking to smack you upside the head. He just wants to remind you tonight, I'm still good because I'm still God. And I am bigger than you. And I am greater than you can possibly imagine.